Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan and welcome once again to the strange and mystical comic book vault. It's time for new acquisitions and I've got 10 books for you this week or should I say last week. I'm getting this up kind of late. I'm going to review 10 books for you from last week. Got some some DC splattering of Marvel, a little bit of independent stuff, lots of Batman. Uh, so we're going to get right into it in just a second. First, I want to mention as always that at the end of the show we're going to hear from Superhero Enthusiast who's going to tell us about some books that I didn't read last week and I'm sure that that will be fascinating as always and uh, I want to say thanks to Elite Comics in Overland Park, Kansas for helping us out with the show. If you're ever in the Kansas City area, check out Elite Comics. It's a great store. They help us out a lot. We sure appreciate them and uh, I also want to give a quick shameless plug. Uh, Elite Comics is going to be featured in our documentary about comic book stores across the Midwest called The Midwest in Panels. It's going to be me and Vince and uh, Brandon and our cameraman Dan. We're going to be going um, all across the planes talking to comic book store owners about what they do and it's going to be really fun. We're going to do this at the beginning of June. We're going to be out for a whole week and uh, we're going to visit nine stores in a week. And uh, we are currently doing a Kickstarter for this, so uh, if you are interested in donating and you want to see what cool stuff we have uh, in store for you, what, what cool stuff we're offering as rewards, uh, feel free to click on the Kickstarter link in the description and uh, take a look at what we're doing. We are already, uh, at the time of this um, recording, 75% in already. We've only been, we've only had the Kickstarter up for four days, and we already have met 75% of our goal, so I want to say thanks to everybody that's helped us out already. I am so excited about this. Uh, the, the, this project is already shaping up, and uh, it's it's going to be super neat. Uh, our logo is by Rockman LP. You might remember him from who reviews the reviewers. He was uh, in the top three last year, and uh, he is doing some fantastic work for us. And uh, so anyway, uh, check it out. We're, it's going to be a really neat movie. Uh, my stepdad's composing the score. I talked to him yesterday. He has uh, some really cool ideas, and uh, it's going to be great. So anyway, um, that's uh, that, That's it for my sa shameless plug. Jump right into DC. We're going to start with Batman Eternal, number two. This is written by a horde of people. Uh, we've got Scott Snyder and... Um, James Tinian the fourth doing a story and script uh, still have no idea how exactly um, they're mixing it up but uh, Scott Snyder I guess is involved enough in the plotting in this that he's got to get a story credit um, consulting writers Ray Fox John Lehman and Tim Seeley with just fabulous artwork here by Jason Fabok um, I'm really enjoying the mood of this book uh, two issues in I am a lot more excited about this than I was before I really enjoyed this issue and I'm liking uh, what it's dealing with. I'm, I, I'm, I'm enjoying that this isn't uh, yet another Batman versus Freak story, but that we're kind of back to the street level stuff. It's still a, a big Gotham story. Uh, it's, it's still a battle for the soul of Gotham sort of story, uh, like so much of Snyder is, but we're back to the kind of mob threat stuff, uh, but with the uh, supernatural and mystical thrown in, which is, uh, which is kind of interesting. And, um, I was uh, excited to see the the, uh, the uh, two characters that were revealed here to be our uh, main, so far anyway, antagonist. And I won't reveal who they are, but we uh, already in the second issue, I feel like the, the book isn't wasting any time, uh, already in the second issue, we have a good uh, idea as to what was behind Gordon's hallucination of the man that he shot, that he thought was holding a gun that really wasn't, uh, that ended up, um, uh, pre presumably uh, uh, being the thing that caused the deaths of several people uh, in a in, in a um, in, in a train although um, I have my suspicions that that's actually what caused it because in the first issue there was a mention that from I think from Gordon even that uh, that that um, electrical box or whatever it was shouldn't have been hooked up to anything that would derail a train or mess anything up like that. Uh, so it, it, it looks like the whole thing was rigged and that Gordon has been framed and uh, so, so uh, we, we find that the mayor is not a Gordon fan and uh, and uh, w has been waiting for something like this to happen because Gordon keeps working with freaks and we find out that the mayor is uh, corrupt and is involved with some uh, with some shady characters and the main shady character that we find out is really behind a lot of stuff um, is a uh, old school major Batman character that I haven't seen in anything in a long time and it looks like we're getting a new 52 reinterpretation of him 
which is kind of exciting. And I, it was a great reveal for me. Uh, I, I, I felt like by on the very first page, and this is maybe sort of gimmicky, but I, I, it, it totally uh, sucked me in, so I liked it. Uh, from the very first page, you're you're wondering who this guy is because he's there, he's talking to the mayor, um, he's he's doing uh, this, this very uh, dramatic in the shadows thing on rooftops, uh, but there's a lot of talk uh, about, oh no, not that guy, oh no, not that guy, and then we get to the end and I'm like, woo, it's that guy so um so that so that was really fun uh it's it's typical uh comic book stringing you along stuff but i totally fell for it i, I really enjoyed it um i love the art in this uh, i I, th I think that it's just beautiful and i i i really i really like the uh the, the dark atmosphere and um, just the the traditional uh, Batman detective stuff in this. Uh, I, I like how like like uh, I, I, I like how straightforward it is in its storytelling so far. I've been I, I've been so used lately to uh, kind of kind of a weird creepy um um aw and not that this isn't uncreepy but i mean i mean just just kind of uh, 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 weird hard to tell what's going on until the just the right moment i'm um, kind of horror batman stories i enjoy that too but this kind of reminds me a little bit more of the batman i grew up with uh, th 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 this is this is a little bit more of the uh, straightforward linear storytelling um well somewhat linear so far we did have that set in the future thing at the beginning of the first issue but you know what i mean for this arc anyway uh, uh stuff from like from like uh, nightfall and no man's land and um all the all the stuff i love and uh, i kind of feel like i'm getting at least a little bit of that in this so um yeah at first i was like oh weekly batman book don't know if i want to have to buy that every week and now i'm kind of really stoked for wednesday so uh, i think this is picking up i'm i was i was really happy with it um and also the uh the verbal tete-a-tete -tete between uh, batman and catwoman is pretty solid uh anyway really really enjoyed it and now, let's go to the other uh, Snyder Batman book for this week. That was even better. It's Batman number 30 by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, the powerhouse Batman team. This, ladies and gentlemen, is maybe my favorite issue of this uh, series, and I've said that lately. Uh, he, he's been topping himself. But I've had my reservations about Riddler, because I keep thinking, if Riddler is capable of this... He's. Ne it doesn't make sense that he's the way he is later. Uh, that that when you, when you get death of the family, that he he still seems to be kind of the um, nobody takes him seriously uh, kind of Riddler, and uh, like like he's he's really full of himself, but he's he's a little he's a little silly. He doesn't really have uh, the kind of ingenuity to pull something like this off. How would how how would that happen? And boy, I'm totally buying it now. I feel like after reading this issue that we might see kind of a rise and fall of the Riddler. That uh, that, that like he, his his greatest plot happened right at the beginning, and when it didn't work, it crushed him so hard that he kind of fell off, and it kind of fell off the map. And um, when he when he came back, he was never able to live up to what he did before. That's that's really the sense I get from this. Um, oh man, did I enjoy! this issue. Uh, I feel like I've got my Riddler, and I feel like I've got my great Riddler story now. Um, so, what, what we have here is the aftermath of the Flood. And we find out why Riddler was actually doing the Flood. And uh, as I figured, it wasn't just uh, let's let's flood Gotham and hurt a bunch of people. It was his way of taking Gotham over. At the beginning of this, the Riddler is in charge. He's he's the uh, intellectual despot. He's taken over everything. And uh, I've never seen this with Riddler. It, I like I kind of geeked out about it. It was really neat, um, especially some of the icon because you know he's got this he's got this tower and he's hidden in some kind of nondescript underground location that nobody knows where he is and he shows up on uh, a big electronic billboard every day and his sadistic plot is really cool because there's a there's some logic to it. Uh, he he says that uh, Gotham needs to get smart and that he's doing it for Gotham's own good. And uh, I really I really like that he's finding a way to almost validate this as as a as a noble motive. 
And so he, uh, every day, he gives the Gothamites a chance for one of them to step up and give him a riddle that he can't solve. Ooh, that's so riddle. That's so riddler. Like he's so arrogant. He's so full of himself that um, that that he is willing. And I get the sense that he actually would do it. Uh, he wants Gotham to prove him wrong. He he thinks that he is the smartest person in the city, and that the whole problem with the city is that everybody um, that, that everybody's basically lemmings, and that they don't think for themselves, and that they let other people run them. And Riddler is running them now. And so it's kind of this it's kind of this power struggle thing. Uh, it's 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 kind of this. No, I'm forcing you to learn how to how to take charge and be your own person, but you have to be smart in order to do that. Uh, and and it's kind of survival of the smartest. Uh, he's he's saying uh, if you were this smart, you could do what I'm doing too. And so I'm doing this for your own good. And so uh, if somebody can give him a riddle that he can't solve then he'll uh, give the city back to the people. It's this crazy Riddler revolution thing. And I don't want to give too much away, but there's a guy who tries to do this, and Riddler knows what his riddle is uh, and the answer to it before he finishes, halfway through it, and the guy made it up off the top of his head. And uh, the, the, the explanation for that is great. I don't know if I buy it. I don't know if in real life that's possible, but it, but it just like like shows you how, um, it demonstrates how incredibly brilliant Riddler is in this. And uh, for, in the context of this, I bought it. Uh, there is a there's a kid in this uh, this this really kind of endearing kid who's trying to uh, figure out a riddle to beat the Riddler with, and he's doing uh, crossword puzzles constantly in order to uh, try to come up with something. And there is a crossword puzzle clue that's given to us at the beginning of the issue, and it's revealed what the what the answer is of it at the end by Batman, and. I think by Batman, and it's uh, and and it's it's kind of it's kind of important for the ideas of the narrative. And I thought that was kind of a neat bookend and uh, kind of a kind of a cool structural thing to do uh, because I I, I spent. Um, a couple of minutes myself trying to figure out what that was, and so this book is challenging me, and uh, it's it's making me feel like the Gothamites, which is kind of fun because I'm like, ooh, if I was in this situation, I'd be screwed too. You know, I'm no good at riddles. That's one of the things I've always liked about Riddler is that I kind of admire what he is able to do and wish that I was that intelligent. Um, anyway, boy, I really enjoyed this. This is a lot of fun, and uh, it's. It, it, it's it's as serious as it ever was, but with this kind of uh, like like traditional Riddler twist. Like now he's totally coming into into his own, and he's he's full fledged Riddler now. And I feel like this is uh, uh, potentially a really good uh, argument for the Riddler as a villain. I think people that uh, that, that kind of dismiss the Riddler as um, just a silly, ridiculous character who always gives away his his plots. Uh, what the heck is wrong with him? He's he's not even a fun kind of insane. He's just stupid. Uh, people that still think of him that way and uh, and and just think, well, there's never been a good Riddler story. Read this, cause I think it could potentially change your mind on on the character. Um, it, wow, so good. Re Really, really good. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna jump over to Supergirl number 30, or as I like to call it now, um, Red Lanterns 2. Uh, this is by Tony Bedard, with art by Emanuela uh, Lepicino. So uh, now I, I'm getting, um, I'm getting my kind of kind of two of my favorite books linked, and uh, I feel like I get a book I like a lot twice a month now. Uh, and th this is a lot of fun. I'm kind of getting this too, um, in a, to a lesser degree, in uh, the miniseries Deadpool versus Carnage, because uh, I love Bun's Deadpool, and I love Carnage, and so now I get them in a book together, and that's fun. But th but with this, uh, I'm, I'm getting this, uh, this constant crossover between two of my favorite DC books, uh, with Red Lanterns and Supergirl. And uh, this is really the first issue of Supergirl, uh, after she's um, fully come into her own as a Red Lantern. And I kind of wondered if she would, in her book, kind of run off and do her own stuff as a Red Lantern and not be with the team. And I sort of hope that wouldn't happen because it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. And that's not what's happening at all. Uh, the, the Red Lanterns are in this, and this feels like an extension of that book. So if you're reading Red Lanterns, you really kind of need this because um, the, it centers on Supergirl. Uh, certainly she is the protagonist for this, but she's a lot like Seven of Nine 
in Voyager where once she's been added to the cast, it's all about her. So when you go to Red Lanterns, it's still pretty Supergirl heavy because she's a she's a new character. It's kind of a novelty to get to see a Kryptonian um, turn into a Red Lantern, just like it was a novelty to get to see a Borg turn into a Starfleet officer in Voyager. And uh, although it's going to get less super, super girl, super, super, super girl. It's going to get less super girl heavy in Red Lanterns. I, uh, I'm, I'm sure, um, uh, next issue in that book, because they're finally going up against Atrocitus, it looks like. Uh, but anyway, so what we have here, I think is, uh, some really cool stuff. If not, um, kind of, kind of convenient uh, uh, story-wise, but I don't mind for this kind of material. Uh, it, it seems unlikely that somebody whose planet uh, blew up would be constantly running into people who destroy entire planets, but it is uh, thematically a really good thing for her to constantly have to deal with that. And so, um, it, it, so, so like, like, um, in a, in a practical sense, it's kind of hard to buy, but in a, uh, character place, um, it's something that she has to, she has to deal with. So, um, we're manufacturing these situations and, you know, at least she's off earth and, you know, flying around a lot. Maybe there just are a lot of people that blow up planets. Um, in fact, the idea of Krypton blowing up isn't even um, a, a real unusual thing that like the out out in the universe uh, uh, planets blowing up is actually kind of a fairly um, um, regular occurrence is potentially an interesting idea to explore um, it, it makes it makes her and and in uh, and, and Superman um, a little bit less of a rare breed, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, I don't know. Moving on. Um, what we've got here is uh, this really interesting race that I give the gift of destruction. They go to different planets and they find really weak people and they have this only the strongest survive mentality. And so they ruin weak cultures. They decimate them in order to give them the chance to rise up. And they actually think that they're doing them a favor. It's interesting that this is kind of a motif this week between some of my books. I feel like Riddler has a similar sort of thing, except it, it's also all about his ego, uh, and, and he's not destroying whole planets. Whereas when when you go to, but, but it's the broadly it's the same kind of thing in that it's challenging people and forcing them to rise up by manufacturing adversity. So what we have here is this race that goes to this planet and they uh, and they start they start uh, you know destroying decimating um, people and and and, uh, and and a society and uh, they say that um, they say that uh, you can't become a strong race until uh, something like this happens to you because you've got to rise up over it and uh, that's certainly um, uh, in in my opinion that's certainly uh, true that that uh, that like the strongest people um, that I've ever met are people that have been through some very difficult things and figured out how to get over them but is it ethically okay to go around and force that on people, uh, or or should that be something that, because everybody's going to have some sort of degree of adversity, um, and so uh, and, and so at the end of the day, the question is, is is becoming a strong person a choice, or is it something that is thrust upon you, and, and if it must be thrust upon you, um, whose duty is it to do the thrusting, and um, and uh, so, so Supergirl um, comes in, and uh, she won't have it because I uh, her her planet was destroyed, and she cannot deal with this kind of oppression. And uh, no matter what the excuse is, and so she uses her rage and uh, her her newfound um, red lantern ness and goes up against these people. And um, I think it's a really cool premise. Um, there is a lot of talk between her and the red lanterns about um, what being a red lantern um, actually means and whether whether or not it's about um, being being compassionate or anything like that, or or if it's uh, if it's just rage, uh, and this is a really good fit for Supergirl because uh, as I've said before, she's constantly hitting stuff with her fists, and that's what the Red Lanterns do. Um, there, there's a there's a mention here. I forget if it's uh, Zola Zox or who is who does it says it, but um, th but uh, one of the Red Lanterns in this says uh, we're uh, our job is simply to uh, find injustice and uh, beat the crap out of it, basically. 
and um, that's that's what they're doing. But um, they don't have any finesse, and that is something that, ironically, Supergirl is starting to find within herself a little bit. Is this this sense of the sense of compassion, the sense of finesse? Uh, she has um, a lot of empathy for these people, and feels like the other Red Lanterns are a little bit insensitive in the way that they're dealing with the people that they're saving. And I wonder if it's in fact I would I would bet money that this is going to be for her exactly the same kind of experience as it's been for Guy Gardner. And I think that those two together are going to form a bond over it. That I uh, that becoming Red Lantern and finding that rage is ironically what um, what what makes them kind of uh, kind of find their humanity and um, find their uh, sense of their sense of purpose, and uh, their sense of self-control. Uh, anyway, this is really good, and I'm looking forward to the next Red Lanterns. And like I said, I'm kind of enjoying getting sort of Red Lanterns twice a month right now. Okay, we are a third of the way there. It's time to jump over to Marvel and look at Thor, God of Thunder, number 21. This is by Jason Aaron with art by Asad Ribic, and I was really taken in by this issue, uh, and it, it, I've got future for uh, Thor with the um, uh, being the all-father going up against Galactus, which I just love. And then we've got the um, present-day stuff with Thor still going up against Roxxon. And I'm starting to really enjoy where this is going. Um, the theme that ties these two stories together, because I was starting to somewhat wonder about, uh, you, know, you know, vaguely I was able to pick up on some things, but I was sort of starting to wonder why the these two things were being told in the same in the same arc. Uh, th this is, by the way, a, a five issue story arc, so we've got two more left. And what I what it is, it looks like is. Um, besides just the kind of uh, uh, vague theme of the environment and Thor caring about the planet as much as he cares about the people on it, uh, because because um, Odin Odin Thor not Odin Thor but uh, but but th the the All Father Thor. By the way, he mentions the Thor Force, and that's just funny sounding. Um, the the All Father Thor in the future uh, is fighting Galactus um, uh, for the Earth, and there's nobody left on it. Uh, but but I uh, but he feels like the Earth has sheltered him and. It's in. It's important to him. Uh, the planet itself, and so um, you you have that kind of environmental thing uh, be, because connected to the present day stuff. We've got uh, we've got Roxxon doing terrible things to the environment just for the sake of money, and uh, Thor going against that. But it's also, and this is kind of the bigger thing I think is um, is where exactly Thor's dedication to humanity comes from, and. His um and and uh, his almost obsession. It seems almost it seems kind of a positive obsession, but but his 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 almost obsession of fighting for humanity regardless of how they pay him back for it and whether or not they're grateful. And it looks like he's about to come head to head with that idea in the present day stuff. He's about to uh, have to figure out if he's willing to uh, keep putting his heart and soul into uh, uh, saving the earth in, in, in the present day while he's got people like this um, horrible head of rocks on uh, going against him and uh, trying to overpower him with rules. And uh, there's a lot of politics here. This Roxxon CEO is fighting Thor with corporate corruption. And this is a world Thor doesn't understand. This is a sandbox he does not know how to play in. And it's really, it's really interesting and fun to uh, see Thor being put in this kind of a situation where he is... Uh, completely out of his depth. He's totally out of his element. Thor hits things with hammers, that with with a hammer, and he uses his power to control the weather. That's what he does. That's how he fights his battles. And it gets very, very complicated because the very people that he is trying to save, their rules, their loopholes and politics and um, murky ways of doing business, uh, all of that is getting in Thor's way and preventing him from being able to uh, properly help them out like he wants to. And so um, I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, how, how those two worlds are 
coming together here and uh, Thor getting um, like like it, it's funny because it's a really uh, uh, sad and and kind of gut wrenching moment when it, like, like almost like almost as much as if you saw somebody punching Thor in the face almost as much not really but almost as much as as uh, as, as some of the blows that Galactus gives him in in the future stuff when he gets served uh, he he gets sued in this and. And uh, Thor doesn't know what to do with that. He, he doesn't know how to fight uh, something like this. And um, he's, he's used to uh, his villains being felled um, simply in physical combat. And so uh, it, it, Thor versus corruption, uh, I think, is a really interesting idea and something that I personally haven't seen done before. Um, I, it it might have been tackled um, here and there, of course. I'm not a giant, giant Thor fan, so I've not read everything. But uh, anyway, it, it feels like really fresh territory here. Let's move on to... What if Age of Ultron number three, which so far is my favorite issue of this, and uh, speaking of Thor, uh, this is fascinating. Uh, each issue of this has been, uh, let's kill off a major character in the Marvel Universe and see what the future would be like. And it's taken me a couple weeks to really get what in the heck this has to do with Age of Ultron, but I think I know what they're doing now, um, because... You've got Ultron on the cover, but he's not in the issue. It has nothing to do with Ultron. Basically, the idea is, uh, in Age of Ultron, Wolverine uh, goes back in time, and uh, it feels like the only way he can save the future is to kill Hank Pym. And then there is suddenly an alternate future, which is, uh, in certain ways, arguably just as bad as the one that they were trying to prevent in the first place. And so um, this isn't about uh, changing something in Age of Ultron. Ultron. This is about uh, taking that idea and using it in a bunch of other places. So um, you take Hank Pym out of the equation, and what does the future look like? And and so uh, now we're taking out other major characters out of the equation and seeing what, what the future would look like. So here we have um, Thor getting killed by a um, giant serpent god called um, Jormungan. And uh, he he gets killed, and then um, basically it's uh, remnants of Avengers and Shield that have to take the place of gods because there aren't gods left, and uh, a whole bunch of other people are dead in this, and it's another kind of like last issue um, band of the heroes that are left trying to uh, save the world, and one of the things that in, in trying to save the world from. Um, from Frost Giants and Yormagan and and the the stuff that uh, Thor would be there to fight if he hadn't gotten killed, and they're having to take the place of Thor. Um, Black Widow is really really interesting in this. I like how she's character she's characterized, and um, and uh, it, it's uh, it's primarily the leader of this is is Nick Fury. It's kind of a Nick Fury story. Um, we have Shang Chi here, and we have um, of all people, Microchip. Uh, yeah, the Punisher sidekick is in this, and uh, what he has to do is is um is pretty cool stuff too, and uh, he he actually ends up being incredibly important to all of this. Uh, be, be, and and so there's there's sort of this technical technological component where if you don't have gods, uh, you need technology, and Microchip is kind of your guy for that. And it's interesting because the the Punisher has been killed, and Microchip doesn't want to be called Microchip, and there's some kind of character stuff there for that. Uh, and then um, at the end, there is a really interesting, uh, cool uh, kind of conclusion with Thor's hammer. Um, as as a as a standalone one shot story, I really ate this up. Uh, I liked this a whole lot, and this felt like old school what if. I really really enjoyed this, and um, I recommend it to anybody. If you didn't read the first two issues, if you didn't read Age of Ultron, doesn't matter. I uh, uh, pick this up. This is really 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 cool. Next up, Deadpool versus Carnage, number two. This is by Cullen Bunn with art by Salva Espen. Um, this is all about, well, it's all about being silly and goofy in a crazy twisted way, because that's what you'd expect, Deadpool and Carnage, but idea-wise, this is all about how uh, Carnage wants to be the embodiment of chaos and randomness, and he still being 
a human being with a symbiote is incapable of fully doing that and it drives him even more crazy than he was before. Uh, Deadpool manages to follow a pattern of Carnage's rampage that gets him to, to Carnage and Carnage won't hear of it. He's like, no, I don't have patterns. That's not me. That doesn't have, that, I'm random. There's no patterns and uh, and uh, he's in complete denial about this and I, I thought that was that was a really um, interesting idea. Uh, the humor in this is, um, is uh, still kind of dark and twisted uh, as, as always. Uh, it's kind of what you would expect with, with both Deadpool and Carnage. It's sort of uh, like brutal Saturday morning cartoon stuff. Uh, it's it's kind of this cat and mouse thing, although I couldn't tell you which one was the cat and which one was the mouse, really, uh, so maybe that's not a, a good analogy at all, but uh, it's it's kind of this cartoony thing of, um, you know, I blow you up, and then you blow me up, and then I and then I find some other way to blow you up, and we're kind of we're kind of topping each other, and um, it is uh, it is fun to read in its way. Uh, Shriek is back, and I, I which is kind of fun for me because um, I was really like Maximum Carnage. It's not a perfect book. I I, real, I realize that, but I I still you know there's there's place for it in in, in my in my Carnage heart, and uh, so. We uh, so uh, so we get we get to see uh, him kind of reunited uh, with his uh, 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 creepy twisted love sort of, and uh, then Deadpool um, finds this guy, th this, re this, this really big fat guy who has uh, stolen his one of his uniforms and uh, is really disturbing and looks like he wants to be Deadpool's biggest fan, but it turns out that it's not that at all and that there's actually something that connects them, uh, which I won't give away what that is, And uh, but he's, he's kind of helping um, Deadpool to find Carnage, and um, anyway, it's mostly just a bunch of big over the top crazy action stuff uh, with this kind of vibe. Uh kind of exploring the ways in which Deadpool and Carnage are the same and the ways in which they're different. Um, I'm uh, I'm really enjoying it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the last thing I got from Marvel is Uncanny X-Men number 20. Uh, this is written, of course, by Brian Michael Bendis with art by Chris Bocciolo, and um, things are really heating up here. The plot is thickening um, quite a bit, and what we've got here is a lot of mind games being played between different organizations. Uh, we have this kind of... Um, three-pronged war going on, although a lot of people don't realize that it's three-pronged, um, where uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. and Cyclops' X-Men are about to uh, go to war because uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. seems to be creating Sentinels to go after the X-Men with, and Cyclops won't have that. They've got, uh, they, they, they've got more fuel for the fire in this issue, and then it turns out that what is really going on, and I'm not spoiling anything because we kind of knew this uh, to a degree, is that uh, you've got um, Mystique in here pretending to be Dazzler and she is stirring the hornet's nest pretty hard and manipulating these two sides in order to go to war in the first place. And the and, and I'm really enjoying the nuances of how all of that manipulation and um, and uh, deception is is happening. And that's what I'm really latching on to here. Uh, the end of this uh, gets really heavy and in in a, in a character place. And um, I, I thought that. Uh, the there was a lot of great tension uh, at, at the end of this with uh, Cyclops and Hank McCoy because um, Hank and and as I said last week I'm really glad that Beast is finally starting to get in the forefront of this a little bit and I'm talking present day Beast uh, he is um, kind of untrustworthy to Cyclops which, which is funny because Cyclops isn't trustworthy to a lot of people right now because of what happened with Xavier and he's uh, so so there's there's kind of, there's kind of kind of still questions of hypocrisy and stuff with with Cyclops but there is um, but but he thinks that uh, that Beast may have uh, done something against them, and uh, be, because there is, and I, I don't want to give away too much, but basically there is. Um, there is a piece of information that only one person has, that only a few people have, and, and Beast is one of them, and that compromised them, and that compromised X, uh, 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 Cyclops' X-Men. And Beast says, how dare you, and uh, then craziness ensues for a cliffhanger, and I'm very uh, um, uh, wide-eyed and excited to find out what, what happens next. I really like all the stuff about telepathy here, and how it's used in this universe to uh, gain information and to um, 
and to manipulate people. Uh, this idea that you could uh, th that that um, it's unreliable. That it's kind of like a lie detector test. Uh, that, that that you can um, implant information into uh, uh, somebody's brain. You, 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 like like you could, if you uh, were skilled enough at it. Um, and, and the idea is that a lot of shield agents are trained to be able to do this. You could block. Uh, uh, telepaths from reading your mind and, and finding certain things, but they could still read a lot of your mind and think they have what they need, and so you could use that to um, deceive them and manipulate them. And I, I, I really, I really like the way uh, telepathy is, is played here. Um, the the, uh, the the humor is still good. Uh, there's some funny stuff here with uh, the Stepford sisters and with um, Emma Frost and stuff that I that I really enjoyed. Anyway, um, really really fun issue and a lot of stuff happening now. Um, I, I, I feel like there's been a little bit of Bendis decompression in this book, in, in all of his books lately, and that I uh, hear the ball is really starting to get rolling, and I feel like we're about to get to a big head here, and I'm excited to see where it goes. And now let's look at some not big two stuff. First of all, I want to talk about uh, the X-Files annual. This is by IDW. This is an $8 annual. This is their, their first, and uh, this is written and drawn by several people. There are two different stories in this. Uh, one is longer than the other. There's kind of a main story and a backup feature. Uh, the main story is written by Frank Spotnitz, um, Gabe Rotter, and Shannon Eric Denton. Uh, three writers, really interesting, um, with art by Stuart Sager. And uh, the second is uh, is uh, written by Dave Sim. Uh, and, and it's it's very Dave Sim, uh, with art by Andrew Curie. I... I I enjoyed this, but ultimately thought it was just okay. Uh, this is going to be a very lukewarm recommendation for me on the, on this issue, especially for eight bucks. I just I, I felt like there wasn't quite enough here uh, for um, for that for that price point and um, and for a kind of a kind of a what what. They're, they're trying to make out to be kind of a big deal annual. And I felt, with both stories, I felt kind of the same way. I really liked the premise, and then it felt like uh, somewhat of a, a lackluster ending in both cases. Although the second one, maybe a little bit less so. So uh, what we've got with the first story is uh, a very uh, traditional one-and-done kind of X-Files story where... Uh, Mulder and Scully have to go investigate some kind of case, and uh, it turns out that what it is is supernatural and mysterious, and when you get to the end, you're not 100% sure what exactly happened, uh, but you know a little bit more than you did at the beginning. It's one of those stories, and it's it's all it's all about the mystery and the uh, disturbing atmosphere. And you, the premise is really cool. Uh, uh, there's there's this lone shark that kills a guy, and the guy keeps making phone calls from the grave. And so, uh, an, an hour after he dies, he calls his wife. And uh, of course, with your um, classic Mulder Scully relationship, Mulder thinks he's calling from the grave, and Scully thinks that somebody else is impersonating him. And we, of course, find out. Spoiler alert! But that's not what's going on. And we find out that there's this whole kind of convoluted uh, mythology. That this this is this is sort of where the story breaks down a little bit for me, uh, where there is uh, there's like a uh, spirit that uh, that kind of shows up and punishes people uh, from the grave for breaking the rules. And so uh, this guy is not supposed to be making phone calls from the grave because uh, the universe doesn't want people to know about the afterlife for whatever reason. And so uh, th this this uh, so this guy's uh, wife is being put in harm's way, and um, and uh, it's all because uh, he keeps trying to uh, call her from the grave and that's not supposed to happen and somehow uh, the telephone has linked his soul back to uh, reality so there's maybe a little bit of a hint of uh, this this theme of of, uh, of technology and magic intertwining maybe maybe that's there a little bit and uh, so 
that that's pretty much what the story's about. Um, I enjoyed the idea of it. Not it wasn't wasn't uh, super keen on where it ended up going ultimately. Um, I was a little bit disappointed with the ending, and it was also kind of strange because I think this should have been a crow story. Uh, I, I I think this should have been the X Files crow crossover story because birds are involved and they. I don't know if they are crows or if they're ravens or what they are, but they kind of look like crows and they 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 are kind of um, showing up uh, to do stuff because of this guy who died and won't. I mean, it's not exactly the same premise, but it's weird just after that crossover and while the crow is going on at IDW to have this X Files story with all this bird iconography having to do with the afterlife. That's really strange. Uh, and and, and I, I, I kind of wish that it had somehow been retooled to be a crow story, but that's just me. I don't want to rewrite the thing. Um, like I said, it's okay. What what I really resisted about it and what really kept distracting me was the art. It is the wrong kind of cartoony for me, for my taste. Uh, it, it looks like political cartoons to me. Uh, all the faces are really distorted and um, kind of surreal looking and really exaggerated and uh, it just kept taking me out. I, I, I was I was having a hard time taking Mulder and Scully seriously because they just kept having this really bizarre looks on their face. I, and I, I just I didn't really care for that. Uh, the second story though is really interesting. I wish it was longer uh, but I, I guess it's the kind of story that's supposed to be really super short but then the ending is ambiguous enough that I wanted more because I really liked the idea and I wasn't sure what I was supposed to take from it. So it's one of those things where I'm resisting what the story was doing. It knows precisely what it is. It wants to be that kind of ambiguous ending. Uh, it, it wants you to uh, take from it what you will. But I, I don't, but I'm just saying I wanted more because I really liked it. Uh, what we've, what we've got is this uh, bizarre dream sequence that Scully is having where she uh, imagines in an in, in old uh, high school sweetheart as this creepy disturbing hand with a whole bunch of eyeballs all over it and really long fingernails and there's a lot of interesting symbolism in that that I won't go into uh, but but uh, basically we we uh, we get this establishment of a status quo that Scully has has this dream every night where she talks to her old high school sweetheart as this creepy hand with a bunch of eyeballs all over it, and this this is the last time that the hand is going to show up, and it turns out that uh, that it's not just her imagination, but the boyfriend has actually somehow been communicating with her, it seems like, and he is giving her the chance to uh, drop everything, quit the FBI, and go be with him, because they were that much in love. And so she has to make the choice in this dream sequence to either stay with the FBI or go with him. And what makes it more interesting is that he has information about the case she's working on and is able to give her a straight up ultimatum about it. Either uh, you, you, you open up this file and you either take this information I have for you or you come find me. And that's the choice. And then at the end, she makes a choice. And I, uh, and, and, and I again, I really enjoyed the setup. The art in, in this one is really really good uh it's it's um it, it's a kind of polished artwork i haven't seen for x files yet it looks a lot like uh some buffy and angel comics i've read but um i, I really like just kind of the the creepiness uh of of the hand and um all of the uh the the, the weird um kind of surreal atmosphere you've you've got some panels where uh scully is talking to this hand but then in the background you actually see her sleeping and um that's used to great effect so anyway um this is uh, uh, this is okay, but um, I, I wasn't I wasn't at the end of the day super super thrilled or riveted with it. Uh, the last thing I want to review today is Time Lincoln Continental from Antarctic Press. This is a first issue, and I don't know I I, I haven't done any research on this. I don't know if Time Lincoln is a thing. I got I really got the feeling reading this like uh, this was maybe a new miniseries of a character that has been around because reading it it didn't feel like an introduction at all. If I, and and maybe this is just the storytelling, but it really thrust me right into this and uh, and uh, it wasn't hard to latch onto or figure out what was going on but it really felt like a world that was established and that has been around for a while I don't know if that was if that's the case at all but anyway uh, so 
Time Lincoln goes around to uh, different time periods and pulls people out of the time stream just before they get assassinated. And he is going up against uh, nefarious foes in history that are trying to uh, ruin America, basically. What's really fun about this is how all of these historical figures are uh, used as kind of superheroes and the way that, uh, you know, it's really quirky and the way that their worldviews are uh, played into the ideas of this. Uh, there's a whole lot of rhetoric. There's a whole lot of um, arguing back and forth between the good guys and the bad guys about um, their philosophies and why they feel the way they do. And there's a lot of kind of uh, personifying um, big ideas and also kind of making big ideas really literal. Like one of the main characters in this is uh, Martin Luther King Jr., which I was really sort of surprised by. Um, um, I don't see him very often kind of fictionalized uh, because I, I it's it's with JFK I mean like it was la it was it was last century and and very recently was still this century um, I was sort of surprised to see that it's done pretty tastefully and also uh, it, it's pretty creative so he is of course a complete pacifist and his power he has a superpower and his superpowers are all about um, nonviolence and so he can walk into a situation and kind of put up this non Nonviolent shield and and uh, and 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 stop um, violent things with it, which is kind of fun. They're going up against a villain called well, well she's actually okay. So there's a villain who is called the Man, and uh, he is employing uh, uh, crazy characters with hilarious puns and play on words. So we have Manchuria and her candidates. And she uh, she employs um, all of these different candidates in order to uh, basically try to take over the world through discord. And uh, one of the, the, uh, the big things that she uses is this huge army of Lee Harvey Os Oswalds, which is hilarious. Uh, this, this book is very funny, uh, but there's also a lot of real social commentary in it, and it's it's very off the wall. Um, everybody is very archetypal. Uh, everybody is uh, pretty two dimensional because it's kind of uh, trying to just realize a lot of ideas on a page through these characters and through this kind of tongue in cheek way. And um, nobody is like a fully realized character. They're they're all kind of stand ins for ideas, uh, and it is a melodrama. And I think it works. Uh, it's. It's, it's, it's pretty cartoony, and um, it, it's, it's, an, it's an adult cartoon. Um, there are a couple of like language things here and there where it, it, it's kind of not for kids, but it's not like a super, super violent or bloody uh, book. So, um, you know, as long as, uh, I guess as long as you don't mind your kids uh, reading um, uh, phrases like pissed off, I guess it's okay. Uh, but it's, it's a, you know, it, it's PG, PG-13 stuff, but, um, but, but anyway, um, uh, the big thing I latched onto was this commentary about, and I was surprised by it. Uh, it actually kind of hit me. Th this this commentary about uh, sowing discord by dividing people, and uh, the book directly deals with the division of our culture into uh, into uh, conservatives and liberals, and uh, and, and and it says that. Um, like the man is doing this on purpose and uh, I mean it's on the nose but it knows it and it's fun about it too and and, and it, it's kind of um I, I clearly the author is um I don't even think I mentioned who did this uh this this is uh okay who wrote this who wrote this oh uh Fred Perry uh story and art um okay this kind of felt like maybe it was a writer artist and it is um but anyway so uh, I, I kind of feel like we're sort of seeing his feelings about the country on the page and uh, it's but it's not I don't know if preachy is the right word because uh, I mean you have to read it but it's uh, it's satirical I mean that's that's what it that's what it is uh, and so it is on the nose but it, but 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 it you know it know it knows what it is it's not trying to pretend like it's uh, deep character stuff it's it's a it's it's a political satire, and uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, this looks like a one shot. I don't know if there's any more uh, after this. It, it, it was. It did that kind of thing at the end where it's end with a question mark. 
So I don't know. I guess I guess we'll see. Uh, but anyway, that's it for my reviews this week. And now it's time to uh, go on to book of the week. And let's see what was my favorite book of the week. Well, uh, anytime I get kind of gushy and my voice starts almost cracking like I'm hitting puberty again, I feel the need to go with that book. And that book is my favorite Bat book this week, which was Batman number 30. Uh, oh, you tell that good of a Riddler story and you're going to be bull Book of the week. Uh, my favorite cover this week, I guess, is Time Lincoln Continental because it was the reason I picked the book up. I was like, well, that sounds hilarious. Let's let, let's find out what that's about. Uh, so that's my cover for this week. And uh, let's jump over now to Superhero Enthusiast and find out about some books that I didn't read. Hello, Geek Evolutionaries. I am Alex, Superhero Enthusiast, once again here with BCLDR, books Captain Logan didn't read. And uh, I have a lot of books this week. One was from last week that I missed, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, the book that I did miss was Flash Gordon number 1 from Dynamite. And uh, it was Dynamite. I really, really enjoyed this first issue. And I think it functions really well as a first issue. I'm reasonably familiar with Flash Gordon. Um, not too, too knowledgeable. I've read some stuff. I've obviously seen the movie, which is hilarious and great. Um, and uh, so I'm a little bit in the know. I know, you know, who the characters are. But even if you're not, you've never read Flash Gordon before, you've never seen the movie, you really know nothing about it, I think this is a really good jumping on point. The way that this is uh, sort of framed or structured is um, the opening is we see the main three characters. We see uh, Dale and Flash and Zarkov all on Earth and what their lives were like a year ago before... Um, you know, really the Flash Gordon story itself starts and the whole space stuff. Um, and we see what their lives were like then, and they were all very, very unhappy um, in their different roles. Uh, there's a hilarious uh, scene with Zarkov, very reminiscent of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, in that there's a drinking contest, it seems, in, the in a bar in the Himalayas, and um, Zarkov's completely outdrank everyone, and, uh, you know, he's complaining about kind of uh, how he's not accepted in the scientific community. So all of the characters feel, from what I know of them, to be completely on point and all kind of have a unique voice, which is really, really good. And um, then we, we skip ahead to uh, right now, I guess, a year after that, and um, they're, they're in the middle of trying to escape from Ming the Merciless, um, and they're, they're jumping through all these different wormholes and going to different worlds and stuff, uh, trying to escape. And um, they eventually uh, end up kind of somewhat crash landing in uh, sort of like a forest planet. And uh, uh, there's a bird with antlers, which is just, I thought was the coolest thing pretty much that I saw this week. <laughs> um, and, uh, but basically this, this works really well because every character gets a great moment in this that shows who they are as a character and allows them to... Uh, just kind of show off their awesomeness. Um, even Ming the Merciless in this, who just makes an appearance in a very short scene, um, we see right away, okay, this is the bad guy because his, his soldiers are not able to capture Flash and company and he just kills his general right there on the spot because he failed him. Um, you know, if, if, you know, I can see, I can see in a lot of ways how you know, Star Wars was kind of inspired by Flash Gordon and that's a very Darth Vader thing to do. And uh, I really, really like this. I won't say too much more. I kind of want to give people a chance to, to read it themselves. But uh, I really, really enjoyed Flash Gordon number one. I don't know if I'm going to pick it up um, week to week. I'm just reading so much right now. But definitely this is something to come back to later uh, if I don't. Uh, Doc Shaner is on uh, the art for this. And uh, when I reviewed uh, some Adventures of Superman stuff that he did, uh, I mentioned that he's one of my favorite artists uh, working right now. So it's great to see him on a regular book because his style is just uh, classic and classy and just fantastic. Oh, that does lead me to Adventures of Superman, though, uh, number 51. And unfortunately, I didn't know this till the other day. This is the last uh, installment of this little um, series. And I'm really disappointed by that because I've really been liking this book. And if you've heard me talk about it, um, you know, I'm not really all that thrilled with the other Superman stuff that DC is producing right now and so uh, this was sort of my my Superman fix and I'm not gonna have that anymore and it's kind of disappointing 
Um, it's also just weird too, given how obsessed DC is with the number 52, that this would end at number 51 rather than number 52. Like, at least give us one more issue, um, you know, to, to go with your weird kind of, uh, you know, compulsive everything has to be around the number 52. But uh, this is this is actually really fantastic. It's done by uh, Steve, drawn by Steve Rood and written by Jerry Ordway, um, you know, classic Superman writer. And the way that this was sort of advertised was as a, like a missing episode of the Fleischer cartoon because action really does propel the narrative in this, and I love that a lot. Aesthetically, this this is more the classic Superman costume. It doesn't look like the Fleischer one, um, so you know, aesthetically, you might be saying, well, this isn't you know all that much like it. And I can see how that wouldn't be the case because a big part of this uh, has a character um, who I'll get to in a minute that makes an appearance here that didn't exist back when the Fleischer cartoons uh, came out. But it's that kind of storytelling which I really like and I wish would be embodied more by Action Comics since that is, you know, the name of the book. Um, but basically, uh, Superman is at Star Labs, and Dr. Emil Hamilton says, you know, hey, like, it's Tuesday, so we're going to get hit by a meteor. And so Superman has to go up in space, because, you know, that's the thing that always happens. Um, and uh, basically go stop it, and he gets there and finds that there's a robot, um, and it's a robot from the future, and then somebody else from the future shows up, and that's Omak, which is really cool to see, because um, I'm a big Jack Kirby fan, and Omak is, is really awesome. And... Um, to some extent, it almost doesn't, f like, technically it is an adventure of Superman, but um, for a good chunk of this issue, it's just kind of focusing on Omak, and since I'm a fan of the character, I'm okay with that, but, uh, you know, Superman just kind of disappears for a few pages, and uh, I, I found that kind of odd, but uh, action does really propel the story, you know, spoiler alert, the good guys win. And they defeat the robot, but um, really, really great art in this. Uh, great fun little story. I'm really, really sad to see this book go. But um, Adventures of Superman, I highly recommend just checking out the whole run. Um, there's some good stuff in here. There's some great stuff in here. There's some stinkers too, but um, overall, I just really, really gonna miss it. Um, but uh, yeah, Adventures of Superman number 51, very, very good. Uh, that leads me to the other DC Digital First book uh, for this week, and that's Batman Beyond 2.0, number 18. Uh, as I've mentioned the past few times, we are in the midst of uh, sort of a crossover between the Beyond books and uh, one that focuses on the Justice Lords and their whole universe. Now, the previous issue of Batman Beyond uh, 2.0 focused on the Justice Lords version of Terry um, and kind of showed uh, what his life was like and ended with our Terry running into him and saying, like, I need your help. And we see the other side of it this time, and uh, the whole lead-up. Basically, Terry McGinnis appears in the future. It looks exactly like in Terminator, except you get to wear your clothes um, through time. And, but I guess technically it's an alternate universe, so it's not really time travel, but uh, it's the whole bubble and electricity and all that stuff. And um, uh, basically we see he was supposed to end up in the Batcave, and that's not where he ended up. He ended up on a roof somewhere. And... He gets uh, found by the police pretty much immediately. We see the guy who's leading the police is uh, that version of Dick Grayson, who, unlike our version, isn't missing an eye. That's something that Terry kind of uh, comments on is in a little bit of humor. And uh, anyway, he, he does his Batman stuff and is able to get away from the cops, and he runs into this universe's version of Terry. And uh, I mentioned last time that this version... Uh, of Terry, the Justice Lord version, um, you know, he isn't Batman uh, for one, but he's blonde, and last time I mentioned that was because the whole ep thing in epilogue uh, with regards to the Batman Beyond project and Terry being technically Bruce's son because there's some weird, creepy, super science stuff in there, and this is confusing because uh, immediately, like, we actually see how Terry's becoming a detective in this. Um, even the the other, the Justice Lords universe version of him, he says, like, you've got to be from the past, right? Because um, I, I, I bleach my hair now. I'm blonde because I bleach my hair. And I thought that his hair was blonde just because his parents... The only reason Terry has dark hair is because of, you know, being technically Bruce's son. Because uh, his by quote-unquote biological parents, which I guess one of whom isn't his biological parent, um, both have 
reddish hair um, and not black hair, which is uh, a dominant trait and not a recessive one. But that it just doesn't line up the continuity wise because the Batman Beyond project takes place after the point of divergence for the Justice Lords timeline. So I'm not really sure how any of that makes sense, but. Uh, anyway, I love to see the banter in this between the two Terrys and how the Justice Lords version of the character is um, kind of similar, but obviously, you know, one who went down a bit of a darker path. But I just, I love to see the detective work because that was something that they always kind of showed in the Batman Beyond show was that Terry just was not as good of a detective as Bruce and he has to work far harder at it. Um, but yeah, I know I just really liked seeing that that element of the character. Um, I won't reveal too much of the big reveal um, at the end of this. Cause the whole reason Ter Terry is there in the Justice Lords universe is looking for uh, their version of Batman, and uh, I'll just kind of leave it at that and maybe address what happens in the next review, not to spoil it. But um, really, really cool, really frightening. Um, I'm liking how this is kind of going back and forth, uh, you know, between the issues and. Uh, you know, we're seeing two sides to this story, and I think that's a, a clever way to do a crossover. So, Batman Beyond 2.0, number 18. Uh, really, really good. A lot of fun. I'm going to have some good segues this time, because the next book is Batman and Wonder Woman, and then the book after that is Wonder Woman. So, uh, we seem to be transitioning quite well here. Uh, but, Batman and Wonder Woman, uh, number 30, though technically this is just Batman and Wonder Woman for this specific issue. Uh, I reviewed the previous issue in this run, uh, and like I said, I I read this series up until Damien's uh, death, and uh, just kind of been popping in periodically when Batman crosses over with characters that I'm interested in, um, in the hunt for Damien and preventing Rachel Ghoul from resurrecting him and Talia. And uh, I mentioned also last time that the artist uh, who I quite like, drew Aquaman really, really bizarrely and kind of beefcake and just weird. And I feel like his art style is starting to uh, devolve because Wonder Woman looks gross in this and every female character's face is just bizarre. And this takes place on Paradise Island. That turns out is where one of the last Lazarus pits is. And so Ra's al Ghul is obviously going there to, to throw Damien in the pit. And uh, I'm not going to reveal too much of what happens in the story, but, you know, just kind of they fight and argue, Batman and, and um, some of the Amazons who don't want him there, obviously, because uh, he's male. And uh, there's a kind of a hilarious uh, scene in this where Batman just, like, takes off the cowl and just says, bring it to one of the Amazons. And... Uh, I kind of hope that becomes a meme, you know, kind of like, yeah, I'm the goddamn Batman, or like, bees, my god. Um, it just was so crazy and, and weird and over the top. Um, that's another thing in this, in that the writing was not really all that great. Um, there'd be the occasional line that was like totally spot on and felt really, really good, and then you would get several pages of just weird dialogue and people not talking like people. Um, but basically, they, they eventually get over their fightingness and go find Ra's al Ghul, and Ra's al Ghul has some type of weird crystal thing that he has to put into this pit to activate it. And um, stuff doesn't go as planned. There's kind of a hilarious... There, there's a lot of really weird Wolverine stuff in this, in that there's a panel where Batman's holding the Batarangs between his fingers, and it's like Wolverine claws. Um, and there's another scene where he tells Wonder Woman to throw him, you know... Uh, fastball special style um, at Damien's sarcophagus so that he can catch it. It's just really weird Wolverine stuff in this um, and not Batman stuff. It's just bizarre, something I noticed. But um, Rachel Ghoul isn't able to resurrect him in this and I guess Batman's search for him is going to continue for as long as um, it takes for Damien to be brought back because I assume that's what's going to happen. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just, I did not really enjoy this issue. Uh, the writing was poorer and the art was even poorer. I uh, just really can't recommend this one. So, uh, Batman and Wonder Woman number 30, uh, give this one a pass. And yes, that leads me to Wonder Woman number 30. And, uh, you know, again, a disclaimer, not what I want for Wonder Woman, but a pretty good kind of Greek mythology story. Uh, 
At the end of the last issue, Wonder Woman took on, or finally accepted the mantle of uh, God of War, I guess Goddess of War, because um, deity, I don't know, is in a gender neutral term. But anyway, um, uh, now she has to realize that, oh, she's technically the queen of the Amazons now too, because her mother is still a statue. Now all the other Amazons have been turned into snakes and they've been turned back into people. Uh, but not her mother, and for some reason Hera isn't able to undo whatever that spell was that she cast. And there's kind of a hilarious scene of her saying like, well I should, I should be able to do things just by thinking, and I'm thinking it, and it's not happening. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, Wonder Woman is, is struggling with uh, taking on all these roles basically at the same time. And there's a lot of really good kind of character moments in this between uh, the Azula and her son Zeke, uh, who is the son of Zeus and Wonder Woman and um, all that kind of stuff in this. We see the other side of what's going on in this whole giant conflict over the throne of Olympus since the firstborn, uh, who's this really, really evil uh, son of Zeus, who was his firstborn, um, go figure. Uh, and kind of all the, all the conflict that's going behind, uh, behind the scenes, uh, Poseidon and Hades are kind of at a detente and um, there's some great visual stuff uh, in this issue because of that. Um, that's I won't spoil it, but it's it's really cool. Um, and the firstborn is basically he's he's taken Cassandra, this character that showed up, and he's basically torturing her right now. He starved her to death. He's turned Olympus into basically a giant tower of meat. And uh, he had, since Apollo was very kind of classy, his version of Olympus was like this skyscraper. But uh, firstborn is very very. Uh, sadistic and he starved her uh, for a really long time and then fed her meat and then said oh yeah that was you know how did that taste um, and was it really good and she's like yeah because you starved me and he's like oh that was you know so-and-so who you knew um, he killed somebody close to her and then fed them to her so needless to say he's behaving kind of like you know like the regular Greek gods from <laughs> mythology uh, in a really kind of a just disgusting and repulsive way. Um, but this kind of goes on and we see, uh, we go back to Wonder Woman and she's finally kind of got it together and she says that all of the Amazons now have to be parents to Zeke in a way and protect him because uh, Zeke also has a, a claim to the throne technically as a son of Zeus and Firstborn is going to want to kill him. Uh, there's a really big reveal at the end of this uh, that Zeus is technically in hell, or what they're calling hell. They, they've modernized a lot of the terms um, from Greek mythology, so it's like Hades or Erebus or the underworld, essentially, where dead people go. And uh, he's being uh, tortured by Hades in that he's feeding him stuff, but his stomach is all open and so the food just falls out and he can't ever be satiated. And um, uh, there's somebody shows up in the underworld at the end, and I, I'll just say that much, and uh, really, really frightening, and uh, I'm curious to see how this goes. I guess this book is wrapping up pretty soon, and uh, it's gonna be a new creative team on it. Uh, David Finch and David Finch's wife, um, whose name I don't know off the top of my head, but she's apparently a writer as well, which is really cool to see that they're gonna have a kind of a couple on this. And uh, so I'm probably going to check that out, but I'm really curious to see how this story wraps up um, since it has been so distinct. And I guess I'm also curious just to see what the new run is going to be like. But Wonder Woman number 30, um, not necessarily for Wonder Woman fans, but for people who are into Greek mythology, I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, that does it for my DC books. I'm going to head on over to Marvel now with Hulk number one. Now, with Indestructible Hulk, uh, my past couple of reviews of that, I was saying how I wasn't really digging the story anymore. Um, it was just not, not really very interesting, but it ended in a really kind of frightening place with Bruce Banner being shot in the back of the head. And this issue was all about, um, uh, his surgery and that they brought in this, this expert surgeon who it turns out, uh, actually went to school with Bruce Banner. And so he's thinking all about everything that happened and you know if he had been nicer to this guy in school would he have not gone to develop the gamma bomb and then become the hulk and hurt all these people um 
and it turns out that uh, the people who hired him to fix the Hulk and who shot the Hulk in the first place are not actually um, S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, which seems to be this weird recurring theme that we're seeing across Marvel interpretations, and I'll just say that much. Um, but he's forced to, to work there to, to help uh, fix the Hulk, because they're trying to get stuff from him, um, his blood and various tissue samples and stuff, because these people are like evil mad scientists. Uh, guys, and um, most of this issue is just from that doctor's, that brain surgeon's perspective, and that's a really, really great way to kind of exposition dump about who the Hulk is, his whole backstory, because again, this is a first issue, and this is written by Mark Wade, who is the king of first issues, um, or at least president, since I've now elected him, um, but uh, it's it does the job of, of getting all the stuff across really, really well. And, um, uh, you know, again, just I uh, applaud Mark Wade uh, very, very much for that. But uh, we get to see Brant Banner in really, really terrible shape in this. Basically, he's, like, missing the whole uh, back of his skull. And I'm really only going to just kind of say that and that much of the drama and the moral dilemma in this is the surgeon thinking kind of, oh, my, I am a surgeon, you know, I took the Hippocratic Oath, uh, I am... You know, supposed to do no harm. I'm supposed to always uh, try and preserve life. And would it actually be more ethical in kind of taking a very extreme utilitarian position to just kill Bruce Banner here because he's going to harm people? And then he says, no, that's totally unethical. I can't do that. And then he finds out that the, the people who hired him are not actually S.H.I.E.L.D. and realizes that they want to use the Hulk as a weapon because they come to him with this implant um, which is similar to ones that they use to treat epilepsy in uh, severe cases of the disease um, that would allow them to basically turn on the Hulk whenever they wanted and so you know they could just let Bruce Banner go places and then you know press the button and he would Hulk out and hurt whoever they want him to hurt and so he realizes then that maybe the most ethical thing to do is to again kill Bruce Banner so that he can't be used as a weapon um, and of course all of this stuff is going on uh, without any kind of informed consent on behalf of the patient and whatnot because uh, he's, he's out of it, he's highly anesthetized um, because they don't want him turning into the Hulk since the Hulk is his defense mechanism. Um, and I'll just kind of leave it there because what happens after is very spoilerish. but needless to say, um, holy crap, uh, what happens at the end of this is really, really... Um, kind of expected in a way, but still incredibly shocking just to see um, in, in the panels. And uh, where this leaves off is really, really kind of making me scratch my head and, and go like, ooh, I have no clue where this is going to go now. Um, but uh, I really, really enjoyed this issue. The renaming this to just Hulk rather than Indestructible Hulk makes perfect sense when you know, the whole story that they're telling a senator around, um, you know, Bruce Banner being shot in the back of the head, calling your book Indestructible Hulk is maybe not the best title for it anymore. So um, I'm fine with the, the renaming and the renumbering here, but uh, Indestructible Hulk, or just Hulk number one, uh, highly, highly recommended. I really, really enjoyed this issue. Uh, my next book from Marvel is Miss Marvel number three, and uh, I still think this is one of the best books I'm reading right now. Uh, this continues on, and uh, Kamala Khan is uh, sort of dealing with the aftermath of her rescuing her friends in the previous issue, and uh, it seems like as Miss Marvel, she has inspired them to be better, and uh, her, she sees her friend on the news basically saying, like, it's like she just stared right into my soul and said, like, you know, you can be better than this. And um, so we're starting to see that Kamala Khan is gaining, uh, you know, a lot of motivation to be a hero. But much of this issue focuses on her just kind of getting to know her powers, which is sort of the classic thing, right? And her abilities are to change um, her form and her appearance, and she can make um, her limbs larger or smaller, and she can take um, kind of mystique-like, I guess, take on different appearances. Uh, and um, uh, there's some sort of wacky hijinks in here related to that. There's a, a funny scene where she goes into the, the locker room and because uh, she's trying to escape because her hand 
uh, grew really big and she's like no no shrink and then it shrinks way too small and uh, you know she's just trying to get things under control and she grows really big and she's starting to really get a hang of things and understand how her powers work which is really great to see um, and uh, we also see a little thing in here one of her friends is developing uh, he's like a, a really really smart kid and he's developing this kind of polymer that when you put it on clothing and stuff it will allow the clothing to stretch and change sizes and stuff which obviously I'm sure they're hinting at is going to be on her costume uh, once she finally gets it or just on her clothes in general so that she can transform and do all her stuff and that makes way more sense than the whole unstable molecule thing that Reed Richards has going um, because that's just not even remotely scientifically accurate. But, you know, I, I don't think Stanley um, majored in science. But uh, anyway, this, again, just this really, really great issue, all the character stuff at some point. We get to see in here as well that um, Kamala Khan, as a Muslim American, um, and as a female Muslim American who, who lives in a very, very uh, conservative community, who have a very conservative interpretation of Islam and the Quran. He um, has to deal with that since she goes to a mosque and has to basically hear the lecture from behind dividers. And she even brings up the fact that in the Prophet Muhammad's time, men and women could be in a mosque together without that. And, you know, the, the guy gives uh, some type of explanation of, you know, oh, well, that was just a more blessed time. And, you know, it's clear that she's really not buying that. And uh, it's good to see her stand up for herself and kind of have this, this sense of, of who she is that... Um, you know, as a modern, secular Westerner, um, I agree with, uh, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's really great to see, and it's handled in a way that's not, I don't think, offensive to anyone, and it's just, it's just, overall, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm blown away by how well this is always handled in this, um, but we see at the end of this, she, she has to sort of jump into action as the hero again, um, she decides to try and call 911 at first, and then, uh, she looks at her phone and her battery's dead, and it's kind of hilarious because <laughs> her phone's uh, notification for that, her battery being dead, is LOL, um, no power, and uh, so that was really funny to see. But she, she jumps into action, and things aren't quite what you, s you immediately think they are. Um, there is a whole different dynamic going on with the robbery that she's trying to stop than is immediately apparent uh, if, you've, if you read the issue. Um, she has a hilarious uh, kind of superhero line where she just says, like, uh, she calls the, the criminal uh, a hipster wannabe um, or hipster punk wannabe or something. And it's just, uh, I, I thought that was really funny. And then he, because he's like, who are you calling a hipster? Uh, the next panel. Because, uh, you know, that's just, nobody admits to being a hipster. That's the thing about it. But uh, this ends in a really kind of scary place for Kamala Khan with uh, her trying to stop the robbery. And I'll just say that much. Uh, I, I'm sure you can tell I'm just loving this book. It is fantastic. It's brilliant. The art is gorgeous. Uh, I really can't recommend this enough. We're only a few issues in, so if you want to get caught up, it's really easy to do at this point. Um, so Miss Marvel, number three, highly, highly recommended. My last Marvel book and the last uh, book for this week is Superior Spider-Man, number 31, which is actually the last book for Superior Spider-Man. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about this one either because it's hard to talk about without really getting into just spoilers since this wraps up the whole uh, Superior Spider-Man uh, part of the Spider-Man saga, I guess. And, uh, you know, needless to say, Peter's back and uh, he kind of has to uh, go around and, you know, he has to save the day at the end, obviously, and kind of deal with the consequences of Otto having being been Spider-Man for such a long time and uh, we get to see some great moments in that respect of you know he says to the future Spider-Man 2099 Spider-Man like yeah I was brain swapped with Doc Ock and he's like that's just crazy enough to make sense <laughs> I believe you and um, you know it's good to see because uh, he meets up with the Avengers too who are trying to stop all the goblins in New York City and uh, you know even Captain America is like well at least one of those Spider-Men sounds like Spider-Man now and uh, you know there's so there's great moments like that in this um, the moment where he faces Green Goblin and the way he defeats Green Goblin in this is, is fantastic and there's a great revelation with regards to him in this too that I won't spoil. Uh, it's really, really cool. But uh, the moment where Green Goblin finds out that it's not Otto anymore, the, just the look on his face is, is fantastic. And uh, you know, he can just tell 
tell that it's the real Spider-Man by the way he speaks, and that just shows the great, you know, hero-villain connection there. And, um, yeah, I don't know really too much more what to say without spoiling things. Um, you know, obviously, he's Spider-Man, so he saves the day at the end. But um, there is a backup uh, in this as well that's, I think, almost like as long as the, the main story. Uh, that's called Actions Have Consequences. And most of that is uh, Carly and MJ just kind of talking about uh, everything that they've suffered as, you know, people who are in Peter's life and the consequences of that. And MJ has kind of come to the point where she's saying, you know, uh, I don't want to be in Peter's life anymore because of, you know, everything that's happened. And um, you know, Carly kind of has to make that decision for herself or not. And MJ is really happy that she's finally found a place in her life where she can be who she is on her own terms. And, uh, you know, we get to see Peter in this uh, a little bit as well. He talks to MJ at the beginning, and then he has to go off uh, to be Spider-Man and talk to Mayor Jameson, who, uh, you know, still is reeling from his spider slayers being taken over and then having his face on them, um, you know, since they wreaked havoc uh, on the city and turned on the cops. And uh, that was, of course, all Green Goblin's doing. And uh, Spider-Man kind of talks to him, and uh, J. Jonah Jameson basically comes to the conclusion that, you know, I was not right about Spider-Man all along. He's even worse than I thought he was. He's a sociopath. And uh, just because of the way that Otto, that Otto behaved towards him um, and the blackmail and such. And Peter tries to undo that. And, uh, you know, Peter just does the right thing and says, you know, I'm not here to make you like me. I'm here to tell you that you need to keep going. And, uh, you know, Spider-Man leaves and it turns out that uh, J. Jonah Jameson has resigned from being mayor. He says, you know, that would have been great had I not resigned from being mayor like half an hour ago. And uh, I don't know if he's going back to the bugle or what's going to happen there, but um, he kind of, he references the old Nixon line of like, you won't have uh, old Jameson to kick around anymore. And, uh, you know, then he says, I'm going to do the kicking. So I really don't know what that means. Is, is he going to go back to the bugle? Is he going to, uh, you know, launch this gigantic smear campaign against Spider-Man because of everything that happened with Otto as Spidey? Um, part of me hopes so, because I think that would be a really kind of cool place to take it in a way that, in a place that makes sense to take it since, you know, I get the feeling for the next really long period of time, Peter is going to have to be dealing with the consequences of that, because actions have consequences. So uh, I really, really enjoyed this book. Um, I really enjoyed Superior Spider-Man. It was this interesting little thing. Um, I'm probably going to continue on with uh, Amazing Spider-Man when it returns and just kind of see how things go, because I am curious to see uh, what the consequences are to Otto's actions. But um, uh, I'm also going to hopefully kind of get involved in, in reading some, some classic Spider-Man too, since I got some great suggestions for that now that this is over. Uh, so Superior Spider-Man number 31, uh, I definitely recommend this. Um, you know, even if you haven't been following along with this book, this one or the previous one, number 30, might be a decent place to kind of jump on and get prepared for Peter's return. If you're, you're one of those people who dropped it when Peter wasn't in the costume. That is it for uh, BCLDR for uh, this week. Uh, shameless plug, Steve Baxi and I are going to be covering uh, Batman Eternal as a weekly series over on my channel, and uh, you can head on over to youtube.com slash superheroenthusiast uh, if you're interested in that. Um, as of recording this, the first episode is up, reviewing the first issue. Um, Steve and I are going to record the second one tonight. By the time this gets up, I suspect the second episode will be up as well. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in that, you can uh, head on over to hear more comic reviews from me and from Steve Baxi. Uh, that does it for me, though. I'm Alex, Superhero Enthusiast, and uh, back to you, Captain Logan.